Howdy. Here we are for another session of Ask Dr. John. So um, keep those questions coming. Comments too are fine. Um, good or bad, whatever, whatever you feel, whatever you think, go ahead and send those to us. But we really love your question. Got a really great question. I didn't see it till today. I'm not sure when it came in from um, Mary, an old friend of mine, uh, old patient. And she was asking quite a few very, very good questions about thyroid disorders. So I'm not going to be able to go into that today because I got a little too late to put some things together. But thyroid disorders are a huge, <clears throat> huge issue. Um, we basically have an epidemic of thyroid disorders uh, in the United States. And there are a variety of reasons for that. And it's a very dangerous situation. Uh, low thyroid leads to dozens of conditions from heart disease to stroke to high cholesterol, et cetera. So there's tons of stuff. Um, and if your doctor says your thyroid is just fine, take that with a huge grain of iodine, a little salt on it. And uh, because Western medicine looks for one kind of one and a half to two different types of hypothyroid. There are 27 different types of hypothyroid that can be tested for. And unfortunately, they're not being tested for in most cases. So uh, next week, I guess the long and short of this is next week, I'm going to really take a kind of a deep dive into thyroid. So everything from how do you keep your thyroid healthy to what are symptoms of an unhealthy thyroid? How do you fix it yourself, et cetera? So we're going to go into a lot of things that I think are, should be very valuable to almost everybody. But that's not what I'm doing today. Uh, today, uh, I got a very interesting kind of long question um, about one of my favorite topics. 20 years ago, all... Well, the vast majority of what I treated were gastrointestinal disorders. Uh, I was teaching, I think I took my first leaky gut class where I was a student in 1990, probably 1998, might have been 1997, with a gentleman that I kind of con uh, consider my mentor. Um, and it was just blew my socks off, totally blew my socks off. Uh, I was unaware of the ramifications, uh, how much leaky gut there was, how easy it is to create and how hard it is to fix. And then the value of functional medicine testing in treating that. So uh, that's what I'm going to talk about today. And uh, hopefully you enjoy it. I'm actually going to start with a little trip uh, through the gastrointestinal system because there are uh, several, numerous, numerous um, misunderstandings that I want to try to clear up while I'm going through there. So I'm going to share my screen with you. Okay, so there is a question. My naturopath has said that I have SIBO, CIFO, EPI, and leaky gut. Now, could have all been at one appointment, and or it could have happened at multiple appointments. This person didn't say, but, you know, that's a lot of letters. It's like, you know, the all the federal agencies, the FBI and the uh, CIA and the NSA, et cetera. So, you know, we just love um, acronyms and initials in this country. So what does this all mean? And does it make sense? What a great question. You know what? Does it make sense? Depends on who you ask. I still see doctors who deny that there's a leaky gut. Now, not only is leaky gut a proven, proven, proven issue. Uh, many of the top minds in the world are working on the problem. There are specific biochemical and gut uh, tests for leaky gut. So there's no question about it, but you'll still have it questioned. So anyway, we're going to take a little tour through the gut today. How fun is that? So a tour of the GI tract, exploring the dark secrets. It's like going through the Congo, right? Okay. Now, First thing I want you to notice is that this is a continuous tube where actually we think of ourselves as this solid entity and we've got, you know, a GI tract. It's actually much better to think of us as being like a donut. 
right? We're this solid entity with this whole running through us. And that's really important to remember because 80% of our immune system is lining the gut tissues and is trying to protect us from insults through the gut. There are far more illnesses that can attack us through the gut than there are that can attack us from the outside through our skin. So here you see this entire um, layout and each one of these things is important. Uh, however, a lot of it gets overlooked. So we're going to go through the whole thing and look at some GI problems. Okay, now start at the beginning. So good digestion starts in the mouth. Now, I read some really interesting stuff about that in 1970-ish. Uh, there were a few people that were talking about these principles that I'm going to mention today. And they were talking about chewing your food X number of times. Some people said 20, some people said 100, but I really took it to heart. And so in my 20s, I was chewing my food between 50 and 100 times. I was chewing my tea. I chewed everything. And there's a good reason to even chew liquids. I know it sounds silly, but breaking the food down into this semi-liquid mass is only part of what happens in the mouth. Uh, I've gotten a lot of trouble. Actually, I was in the Air Force, and, in, and when I was in the uh, training camp, um, basic training, and we would have to march together to eat together, and then you'd sit at a table with three other people, and nobody could leave until the last person left. And I was always the very, very last person. Now, this was prime time for smoking. You got to go out and smoke. Uh, while you were waiting uh, to get information to go back to the barracks. So all the smokers avoided me like the plague, and most everybody else did too, because I took so long to eat. Oh, well. Um, good digestion starts in the mouth. The smaller the pieces of food, the more you break it down, the easier they are to break down in the stomach. So what's happening is you've got these pieces of food that are being acted upon by a variety of different chemicals. And as with most um, things of this type, when you're looking to create a reaction, um, the smaller the particle is, uh, or the particles are, the more surface area you get. And so the more the chemicals can work on the food. And enzymes, and primarily salivary enzyme, um, breaks down starches, gets released in the mouth. So if you do not chew your starchy food, let's say you're eating a, some rice or a baked potato, if you don't chew that well, it probably won't completely digest. You need those salivary amylase and that salivary amylase, amylase enzyme, which used to be called tylen, PT, tylen, um, but they've changed it to salivary amylase. At any rate, it starts in the mouth. Then it's healthy for your teeth to chew. Uh, there's a direct correlation between the number of teeth in your head and the onset of dementia and several other diseases. So the more natural teeth you have, the lower your dementia numbers. If you have um, good quality dentures, that's not quite as good as having your own teeth, but better than having a lot of holes in your mouth. And if you have a problem where you have very few teeth, then your dementia risk will be higher, as will your risk of a whole slew of other problems. Okay, so the fewer teeth you have, the earlier the onset of dementia. So really protect those teeth. <clears throat> and so then it goes down in the stomach. So it goes uh, down through your esophagus, through the upper semi-sphincter, it's actually a pseudo-sphincter, uh, into the stomach. And the stomach is quite amazing. Uh, the acidity, which is caused by hydrochloric acid release, can and, and really should reach the pH of around 1 to 1.5. So that's very, very acidic. Now, if you did not have a protective layer in the stomach, that acid would eat right through it. And that's why when people don't have that mucus layer, it does eat through it and they get ulcers, which can bleed and cause death. Uh, it's also a very muscular organ. It isn't just a big uh, bowl there. It's really very muscular. 
It churns and rolls and turns the food. Uh, so you get faster action by the acid. You want to get it really well mixed. Now, I'm going to talk just a moment. So when we do our liver uh, detox and our liver cleanse, I talk a lot about bitter herbs. They're incredibly important. I'm going to take about seven or eight minutes to talk about it here. And I hope you pay attention because this is really important stuff. So Chinese medical history included nutrition. At all times, that was part of the medical tradition. And all herbs and all foods in that culture are classified in a variety of ways. They're classified by their flavor. Is it sweet, bitter, salty? And each of those flavors, by the way, does certain things in the body. And they knew that. If you eat bitter foods, it purges fire. It um, is very healing in a variety of ways that I'm not going to go into all of them. Like sweet nourishes the body and it arrests pain. The bitter herbs actually uh, stimulate the liver. They cause the release of bile. They um, relieve PMS symptoms, etc. Pungent herbs promote movement, sour, astringes, it holds and, and consolidates things in the body. And salty dissolves hardness and accumulations. So they would eat seaweed for cysts and for tumors. And of course, seaweed has very high iodine content and the iodine uh, can still be used and is used uh, for cysts and tumors. Very effective actually. So uh, bitters have been used hundreds of years in European herbalism. You can go back and find uh, the works of Hildegard von Bingen, who was a brilliant herbalist and musician, um, one of the few women to actually uh, run a monastery. Uh, and people, uh, priests going from England to Rome uh, for their visit would actually go hundreds of miles out of their way on foot usually, maybe riding an ox cart, uh, would go hundreds of miles out of their way to visit Hildegard's monastery because she was so famous at that time and her herbal books and treatments were so advanced. Now, the bitter herbs were mostly used and are mostly used for digestion and to create an appetite. So doing an aperitif before a meal, very common in Europe. Uh, there are about 60 herbs that are still used in European bitters formulas. Uh, in Netherlands, it's still common to do bitter hour. So you hang out with a bunch of your friends and you eat and drink bitter food and drink. It's crazy, right? And this is done very frequently. So here's good old Swedish bitters. That's the first bitters I was exposed to. Uh, very effective for many conditions. There's a, my favorite is the one called Eau de Melisse, uh, water of Melissa, which is French by the Carmelite um, monks uh, in Paris, I believe. And it is incredibly bitter. In fact, I can't get it down without putting it on. Uh, on sugar, a sugar cube, but it will clear up your gut faster than anything. <clears throat> in fact, when I was in um, in France and in Paris in particular, with my last girlfriend before my wife uh, Jenny and I got together, which was 29 years ago, so this has been a while, but we would go out to these little auberges where you know it was a kind of a family restaurant sitting alone out in the country and each al alberge would have their own um, stock and trade like the one we went to um, it was goat so everything was made from goat but you could get sheep or cattle or whatever it was and almost everything is made of whatever that thing is that they're famous for well there was one exception and it was a dish called arigo and it was incredibly delicious and thick and just loving, you know, one of those dishes that just makes you feel so loved and um, full and so-called sticks to your ribs. Well, I'm on my second dish of Arigo and I look up and everybody at my, at my table, there were about my six to eight of us was staring at me and everybody in the rest of the Auberge was staring at me because apparently you don't eat a second bowl 
of Arigo. Mm -hmm. Sure enough, got home, went to bed, woke up after a couple hours, literally with the worst stomach ache I've ever, ever had in my life. I thought I was going to die. And it's like, oh my God, you know, what are they going to do with my body, et cetera? And I was in agony. And so my girlfriend called her friend in and she laughed and she brought this eau de melisse, worst tasting thing I've ever had in my life. Well, that's not quite true. I had stinky tofu when I was in China, but it was bad. Uh, put it over a sugar cube and I ate it. And within 15 minutes, my digestion had cleared completely. That's how powerful bitters are. So lots of alcoholic beverages and other drinks really started out as bitter tonics for health. So Campari, beer with hops is very bitter. Coffee, tonic water. Um, and it's a long held tradition in most forms of medicine that good health starts in the stomach. Hippocrates, he said, all illness starts in the gut. Li Dong Yen, who's my hero, wrote the Piwei Luna, the treatise on the spleen and stomach. And he said that all starts in the spleen and stomach. And we've got 100 million Americans with digestive disorders, really badly affecting their lives in a number of ways, as we'll get into in a minute. So, at any rate, uh, everybody ate a lot of bitter food. And then as sugar and sweet foods and more spices came, uh, became easier to find, populations in general starting, started turning to the more pleasing tastes of sweet and salty. And of course, those are very hard on the body. They lead to diabetes and heart disease and fatty liver and stroke, you name it. And now many people get most and sometimes all of their bitter flavors from alcohol and coffee. So these herbs are very powerful to stimulate the bitter tasting taste buds. Those are primarily on the rear of the tongue. And so you notice sometimes you get this really bitter aftertaste. That's because it's literally on the back of your tongue. And these are specially, um, these are very specialized and they taste the food and then send the signal to the brain, which stimulates the vagus nerve, which has now gotten very popular around. And that causes a release of gastric acid, gastrin, pepsin, etc. So as soon as the food stimulates those bitter receptors, your food your food, your stomach gears up for the food that's coming and is ready to greet the food with all of these chemicals that you need to break down the food. How brilliant is that, right? Just brilliant. But if you don't stimulate that bitter taste, that's probably not going to happen. Now, one of the problems that we see is that um, vegetables, uh, kids that just won't touch vegetables, it's often because they are <clears throat> bitter tasters. They taste bitter more than, or the flavor bitter more than other people do. And they just cannot tolerate having those vegetables in their mouth. Okay, so that's a, a common reason why kids don't like bitters. And even if they are not super tasters for bitter, they still have better taste receptors than most older people. Now, the most amazing thing is your gut has about 4,000 square feet of surface area. It's like a tennis court. And you only have about 20 square feet of skin. So remember I was talking about how important it is to protect the gut, 4,000 square feet. And you have receptors in what's called the enteroendocrine system of cells. So entero, you know, uh, relating to the intestines and then endocrine, the hormonal system. And so this is the largest endocrine system in the body. Now, in the gut, we know that there are already, we know that there are 30 crit critical chemicals that are released when the bitter taste, it stimulates the receptors. Now, when it's in your gut, you're not gonna identify a bitter flavor, but those receptors are responding to this chemical. They release about 30 known chemicals. There are probably far, far more than that, but these uh, really stimulate the digestive system. So your food's being tasted all through your gut. 
It triggers something called cholecystokinin, which stimulates uh, the release and production of um, bile and pancreatic enzymes so that you can digest your food. If you don't get that cholecystokinin release, you're going to have a very difficult time digesting um, particularly fats and uh, carbohydrates. So you really can't digest your food without those. Uh, so the bitter receptor also slows gastric emptying. It keeps the food from moving through so quickly. And so that whole feeling full uh, sticks to your gut kind of idea is really stimulated by the bitter flavor. It also, and this is really critical, it increases hydrochloric acid production. So hydrochloric acid is what makes your stomach acidic. An acidic stomach is needed to absorb iron, to absorb calcium, and to stimulate uh, intrinsic factor so that it will bind B12 so that that can be absorbed also. And so one of the dangers, uh, the significant dangers of using uh, medications that turn off the hydrochloric acid, right? So the proton pump inhibitor inhibitors, the H2 antagonists, et cetera, is that they increase osteoporosis in women by about 240%. Uh, they increase uh, B12 anemia significantly, and they increase uh, iron deficient anemia. So it's really critical to have that hydrochloric acid and you need the bitter flavor to stimulate that. Okay. So yeah, don't remember any of this. So it stimulates glucagon-like peptase peptide one. Okay. So that stimulates insulin release to help keep your blood sugars in range. And there's a class of diabetes drugs that uses this system. Um, but what's really trippy is they have found cells that respond to the bitter flavor throughout the respiratory system, the olfactory system, your brain, the testes, the thyroid, thymus, bone, heart, and they're probably everywhere. This is just where I have read that they have proven they exist. And in the heart, they contribute to elasticity, antispasms, and they increase blood flow. Okay. Timing of bitters, 15 to 30 minutes before a meal. It takes about 15 minutes to trigger the GLP-1 and the other enzymes. If you can't stand the bitters, you can take them as a pill. Um, and it only takes about a week to shift the taste uh, to reduce sweet foods. And so, you know, keep them out in the open where you are reminded. If you like to have a drink in the evening, you can get little um, uh, German, several German companies make little tiny bottles of bitters that have a little alcohol in them. So you don't even have to refrigerate it. Um, and that can uh, be done before your meals, a little aperitif. Okay, so we're going to look at some conditions. This is Barrett's esophagitis. So this is looking down someone's throat and you can see that red area. And this is where they've had too much stomach acid coming up into the esophagus. Now I said, you want a very acidic stomach. However, the sphincter, it's a pseudo sphincter here has to close. And I'm not gonna get into why that doesn't close, but it's the opposite of what most people think. It's from low stomach acid. It is not from high stomach acid, but if it doesn't close, then the acid can come up and burn the throat. It can actually get up into the lungs. And there's certain cases of chronic cough that, you know, they're not getting figured out, but actually they're being caused by the stomach acid coming up and burning the bronchioles and sometimes getting into the lungs. Okay. So if you get a bitter taste in the mouth, be a little suspicious. Uh, some remedies, eat small meals. Maintain your acidity. Uh, you can sleep with an incline. Some people use the little raised bed uh, a or a wedge. Uh, about four inches is usually enough. And do your last meal three hours before bedtime. And if you're still having some difficulty, if you do not have really extremely high blood pressure, uh, take some baking soda before you go to bed. If you have high blood pressure, then there are alternatives. Okay. And here you can see it. If you have low stomach, now this is where 
it gets confusing with this whole acid uh, alkaline thing. People think that if you eat alkaline, your whole system is alkaline. Not true. And fortunately, it's not true because every little bit, every few inches of your intestine and your GI tract needs to be at a different pH level, a different level of acidity and alkalinity. But if you start with low stomach acid, you get poor digestion. Then you get protein and mineral deficiency. Then you get acidic blood from low stomach acid. And then you get insufficient nutrients to produce stomach acid. And you start that whole, whole um, circle, vicious circle again. Okay. The other thing about stomach acidity is it's important to kill the microbes. You know, you eat something, there are bugs on everything. There's bacteria on everything you eat, and there's yeast on most everything you eat. But having a good acidic stomach will keep the bugs from getting down into your intestines. Now, heme iron, oh, that should be M-E-A-T, not from a meat, but from meat, flesh, needs only mild acidity in the three to four pH range. So that's not very acidic. Um, iron removal from vegetables needs a very acidic environment of around 1.5. So if you are a vegetarian or a vegan and you are on medications to lower your stomach acid, you are in trouble. Guarantee you've got problems. There's no way around it. And so if you're in that category, then see a functional medical doctor or, or someone like myself that treats these issues. Okay, this is way too complex, I realized after I got it in here, but the point being this, up here in the stomach, you've got this intrinsic factor that's released by being stimulated by stomach acid. It grabs the vitamin B12. That then goes all the way down, all the way down to the end of the small intestine where it finally gets absorbed. Any problems in here can prevent B12 absorption, which can lead to stroke, heart attack, uh, peripheral neuropathy in the feet. It's one of the primary causes, uh, early dementia, et cetera. So this is a very important system. Apple cider vinegar, that handles a lot of it. Uh, you can now get apple cider vinegar in gummies. You can get it in capsules. You can do a liquid that also has honey in it. It's all good, but I highly recommend uh, doing a little apple cider vinegar before your meals, particularly. Well, here, I'll, I'll go through this a little bit. So it's going to increase stomach acidity. It's antimicrobial. It kills bugs. It helps relieve bloating, gas, and belching because it improves digestion. And then with good digestion, then the food doesn't ferment. And it's that fermentation that largely causes the gas and bloating. But also, this is really cool. So, you know, healthcare professionals have known for, I don't know how many thousand years, uh, that apple cider vinegar and vinegars were really, really great for your health and knew some of the benefits, but didn't know why. And it's over the last couple of decades that there have been these awesome studies showing what happens with the apple cider vinegar. And one of those, They've proven that if you take apple cider vinegar before a meal, with, particularly with carbohydrates, that your postprandial blood sugars, your after eating blood sugars, will be 30 to 40 points lower. Now, for most pre-diabetics and diabetics, that's life-changing. And so it blocks an enzyme that breaks complex carbs down into simple sugars. And because of that, it lowers blood sugar levels after you eat and a lot. It's not a small benefit. Okay, it improves insulin sensitivity to a high carbohydrate meal and subject with insulin resistance or type two diabetes. There's a study. Uh, if you're curious, go ahead and check it out. Um, so compared to placebo, vinegar raised whole body insulin sensitivity. That means how well are your cells balanced so that they are sensitive to insulin, so that they allow insulin to bring sugar into them with less resistance. So in this case, the 60 minute post-meal interval was 30% better 
if people did apple cider vinegar. That's, again, quite shocking. Okay, acetic acid, which is uh, vinegar, basically, uh, suppresses those disaccharides, as I mentioned, and it also raises uh, these glucose 6-phosphate concentrations in skeletal muscle, and that gives you a benefit that's close to metformin. Uh, and so rather than take metformin, you may well be able to get by with apple cider vinegar. Metformin has side effects. The side effects of apple cider vinegar are better health. Okay. Hiatal hernia. Um, so a lot of times patients will come in and they'll say, you know, my food just doesn't feel like it's moving through properly and it sits there. And then a couple hours after my meal, I get some um, reflux or I get some acid up into my throat. And often that's from a hiatal hernia. So here's the esophagus coming down. It has to go through this hole in the diaphragm. Well, this hole, as we get older, can get stretched. And then a piece of the stomach can get pulled up through the hole. And we call it a hiatal hernia. Now, sometimes they're sliding hernias and they can be pulled back down or there are some other mechanisms by which they can be put into place. Sometimes they don't slide and you might then have to do a more dramatic intervention. But it's very common. When nothing else makes sense, I always suspect with the gut, I always suspect hiatal hernia. Okay, um, here we've got H. pylori. So here we've got all these folds in the gastric mucosa. This is all the coating for the stomach so that the acid doesn't eat a hole in it. And here are all the muscle layers. You can see they're running in several different directions. So it's really churning and churning and churning. And if you get an infection with H. pylori, the H. pylori can live in a high acid environment. It then corkscrews its way through that mucus, that mucus in here, it corkscrews through it, and it will start uh, attacking the stomach itself. Well, it then leaves a hole there so that the stomach acid can go through and start burning the stomach. And eventually it can actually burn all the way through and someone would get a bleeding ulcer, which is a life-threatening event. Uh, before that happens, they're just gonna have a lot of pain and discomfort. So there you go. There's a nice ulcer, nice hole in there, a little burn. And here you can see, so here's the large intestine on the outside, this darker red. And notice it doesn't uh, take a nice smooth path, right? So it comes up, here's the appendix down here, comes up and it takes a pretty um, steep turn there, about probably 130 degree turn. And so, all of this is having to go around that turn. And then it gets over here to this other, the splenic flexure, and it takes an even sharper turn. So it's not uncommon for people to have discomfort here at the hepatic flexure, or over here at the splenic flexure, or down here um, at this last flexure. Now you can't see it here because the small intestine's the way, but the intestine actually comes up and then back down. And so that's an area where you can get discomfort also, particularly with constipation. Now, these small intestines are just shoved in there, basically. Uh, most people have about 22 feet of those. Again, if you lay them out and you mash them because they've got little villi, little finger-like projections, but if you brought them out flat, there's the surface area of a tennis court. That's why you can uh, get so much digestion and absorption of nutrients. Okay. Pancreas and gallbladder. Gallbladder, you can't, we don't have the liver over it, but the liver sits over the top. Uh, when this gets stimulated, then it releases bile that comes down here into the common bile duct and gets dumped into the beginning of the small intestine so that you can absorb, I'm not sorry, not absorb, so you can break down fats. And then here you get lipase and amylase and a ton of baking soda. Um, sodium bicarbonate actually get released so that you can start uh, doing a finer breakdown and digestion of fats so that you can then also uh, digest carbohydrates. And then the 
baking soda or carbon dioxide is there to neutralize this whole mass because it's come in here in a very acidic state from the stomach. And so you need to buffer it so it doesn't burn holes in you. So lots and lots of bicarbonate of soda. And these are just, these are the, the chemical messengers that are turning things on and off. Now here, you see the GI tract. Here's the pH in a fasted, meaning they haven't eaten for a few hours and the stomach's empty. You're going to see a pH in here. And you see as it comes down through here, you get big changes in the pH. It can go anywhere from 1.7 to 8, depending on where you are in uh, the intestines. Now, one of the things to remember is since the pH is changing every few inches, it means that your microbiome is changing every few inches because the microbiome, one of the things they're dependent on is a particular pH in which they can survive. So there you go, same thing. Um, EPI, now we're getting into the conditions, those uh, questions that my patient asked, EPI, endogenous pancreatic enzyme insufficiency. Wow, that must be really nasty, severe stuff to have a name like that. I remember when I first heard this term, I was literally driving to work and there was a commercial, and I don't remember it exactly, but it was something like, forgetting your neighbor's name, embarrassing. Walking into your closed sliding glass door, embarrassing. Talking to your doctor about your poop, normal, right? And they were encouraging people to start paying more attention to these issues. But the reason is always fascinating. Whenever you hear a commercial like that, it's because there is a drug to treat a condition. And so they then name a condition that the drug treats, and then they start advertising it. EPI or endogenous pancreatic enzyme, I probably treated in the first patient I ever saw, and I've treated 60,000 patient visits since then, and at least 30% of them had EPI, okay? Hopefully not when we were through treating it, but at least at the beginning. So it just means the pancreas isn't producing enough enzymes to digest your food, okay? So the easy way to treat that is give you, give you some additional enzymes, uh, at least short term, so that you can break down that food. You just take them when you eat your meal and it helps you with it. Now, there are a variety of tests for this. Uh, we do often a comprehensive digestive stool analysis to test for lots of things, but including chymotrypsin, which tells us if there's EPI and a couple dozen other tests. Uh, when an, an enzyme the names of enzymes end in ASE. So you've heard of lactose intolerance. The treatment for that is lactase. Lactase is the enzyme that breaks down lactose. So any ACE will break down an OSE, right? So cellulose is broken down by cellulase. So we need lipase to digest fat. We need amylase to digest carbohydrates. We need pepsin and protease to digest protein. We need cellulase to digest cellulose, which humans do not do very, very well at all. We basically can't digest cellulose. Um, and that's why it's for us is roughage or fiber because it just goes through us basically the way it came in. Now, other animals, ruminants with several stomachs, um, will produce cellulase so they can break down the cellulose. Now, you can also use ox bile or bile salts to emulsify. So if you have a greasy plate, let's say you're a meat eater, you had lamb, and that grease is very difficult to clean off the plates, right? But you put some detergent on it, and the detergent just basically explodes the fat molecules, making it uh, easier to clean the plate, and that's emulsifying it. And that's what the ox bile or bile salts do in your gut. They emulsify it so that it can break it down into smaller pieces so that the lipase can then work to fully digest it. 
So if your gallbladder is blocked or you don't have a, a gallbladder, then you're not going to be able to emulsify fat properly and fatty meals may go straight through you. They may cause diarrhea, et cetera. Um, Chinese call them duck dropping stools for because they look like duck droppings. So again, we got 4,000 squeed of seat, feet of surface area. And that terrain is damaged. If it gets damaged, it's very significant. It can't absorb the good stuff, but it will absorb the bad stuff because it'll go right through the linings. And once damaging microbes get a foothold, you're in trouble. So what damages it? Bad bacteria, fungus, candida, viruses, protozoa, worms. And don't think we don't have worms here. I catch parasites in people all the time. Food allergies and intolerances, heavy metals, all of those damage the small intestinal terrain. And there are a ton of other things. If you're drinking chlorinated water, uh, what does chlorine do? It kills bacteria. If you're drinking fluoridated water, any of those things will damage the small intestinal terrain. Okay, so here, here we see a healthy intestinal lining. And you see these long finger-like project projections going out. So it's like if you go down to the marina, if you could just dock your boat on the um, on the land, you couldn't get very many boats, right? They just there's not enough room. But if you put these finger like projections out, uh, piers, et cetera, then you can dock a lot more boats. And that's what's happening here. These villi tremendously increase the surface area. But if you get long term inflammation, these are actual photomicrographs, actually, this is what happens. No villi. No villi means no absorption. But you do from the inflammation then get leaky gut. And so the cells actually shrink from the inflammation and food particles that are undigested and a variety of toxins get through and they will go into the bloodstream. And then they cause massive harm uh, as those inflammatory chemicals go all through the body. Same idea. This is a little bit more fun, I think. And here's another leaky gut one. I, I just left this one in because it's kind of fun. Okay, so you get all of these things that are coming into the body and they're getting through this non-intact intestine, right? Intestinal barrier dysfunction, that leads to food allergies. It's actually food intolerances that it leads to. Uh, immune system abnormalities, autoimmunity. You, you can't basically have, well, that's not true. There's very little long-term autoimmune dysfunction that doesn't have a leaky gut component. Very little. Okay. So, a guy named Alessio Fasano. If you're interested in the gut, check Fasano out. He, He's the man, um, and he uses zonulin as the marker for leaky gut. Uh, if you have leaky gut, you'll have zonulin in your bloodstream. If you don't have leaky gut, you will not have zonulin in your bloodstream. It's as simple as that. It's a one of the most straightforward tests you will ever find. But if there's zonulin, you know you've got leaky gut and toxins are leaking into the bloodstream. Now, his sh study showed that every time, Every time, no exception, that a human eats wheat, they develop transient leaky gut. Now, if you're really healthy in every other way and your gut's really healthy beforehand, that will reverse after some period of time and you'll stop having leaky gut. But if you already have leaky gut or inflammation or a tendency, this can cause permanent leaky gut. And I hope you're seeing why they call it leaky gut. It's because your gut actually leaks, right? This isn't a cute little term. It's, it's the truth. Okay. Now, what we're also finding is that, Catherine, what's the doctor's name? Silverman? Silverman. Okay. Dr. Silverman uh, published a study looking at brain trauma. And actually, it can be any form of trauma. But brain trauma is what he was studying. Um, concussion caused inflammatory damage in the brain. And it'll change the messages from the brain, largely through the vagus nerve. You know, that should say messages to the stomach, 
lar- or the gut, largely through the vagus nerve, then the leaky gut. So that then will cause leaky gut. Then the leaky gut causes more brain inflammation. So you see, you get this circular system. The brain gets damaged, gives off inflammatory chemicals, damages or changes the output of the vagus nerve, which damages the gut. Leaky gut occurs, and that causes more inflammation that damages the brain. And you cannot heal one of these without healing them both at the same time. It won't work. So in concussion patients, and I see a fair number, um, you know, my wife treats rugby players and uh, football players, but I see mostly rugby players. Um, you got to treat their gut, yeah, because this is going to happen. They're going to get these problems. Now, there are other in my clinical experience, there are many other types of traumas that can do the same thing. It is not just concussion, um, but this is a big, big problem. Okay, there's a, an esophagus. You can see there's some erosion there. Um, so how do you he- heal a leaky gut? First, if there are food hypersensitivities, you have to find out what they are and remove them. If you don't know, you start with the most likely offenders and you remove those. Uh, take the appropriate strain of good quality probiotics. And I can't stress quality, quality, quality. Uh, there are companies that do really good testing of their own and other companies' probiotics, and they routinely find that there are no live cultures in some Companies probiotics uh, and other times they find them that after 90 days, there are no uh, live cultures. Uh, so we are very careful about the quality that we use. Uh, you slowly kill yeast because if you kill ye- yeast quickly, they give off about 187 chemicals that will make you very sick. So you do it slowly. You slowly kill any parasites and you heal the intestinal lining. And you have to kind of do that whole thing pretty much at once. Here are the most likely offending foods. Uh, So glycoproteins are proteins with a sugar coating on them, basically a shell, and they're very sticky. And what happens is when you eat them, they literally adhere to the lining of the small intestine. And so they stay in contact with your gut longer than other foods. And so they're more likely to cause an inflammatory uh, reaction. Uh, It is my opinion that nobody should eat wheat, Uh, not the wheat we have now. You know, the older uh, types of wheat, the einkorn wheat uh, had a lot of nutritional value and it wasn't as damaging. So that would be okay, but you're not going to find it very easily in the U.S. Dairy, uh, very, very, very Few people should eat dairy, and when they do, it should be really carefully done. I've done whole shows just on milk and dairy, Um, and then these other offending problems. Okay, kill yeast slowly. So yeast attracts heavy metals, particularly mercury, and as you kill the yeast, uh, you'll release that mercury back into the system. So you have to kill the yeast fairly slowly, slowly, and you want to use very particular binders, right? Things that will kind of sweep out the gut and attract those heavy metals and attract the chemicals from the yeast while you're killing it. Otherwise, it's just going to get released back into your gut. If you have leaky gut, then it's, which is, you will, because that's what we're treating, you will reabsorb it and you've accomplished nothing. Okay. So uh, the order is very, very important. Now, low levels of yeast are normal. Uh, there are tons of yeast killers that uh, you can read this or we can go into it and they're very effective. So, CFO, that's small intestinal fungal overgrowth. And this is a picture of an actual gut with candidiasis with a yeast overgrowth. And you can see the tissue is very red. It's uh, be very inflamed from this. Okay, then you got to rebalance the flora. And this is almost never done properly. If you look at the studies, all of the large studies are using 900 billion to 3 trillion colony forming units, CFUs. 900 billion to 3 trillion. Most of your probiotics don't have 
10%. A lot of them don't have 1% that many units. And the studies are very clear that it, you have to, in many cases, use very large doses to kind of shock the gut back into shape and get it uh, with the high enough levels of those, the gut will start healing itself. At lower levels, uh, you get some benefit because it's kind of, you know, hopefully it'll uh, colonize and it'll push some of the bad guys out. But for serious conditions, um, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, any inflammatory bowel disease, et cetera, you need very large doses. Um, as, uh, small intestinal bacteria overgrowth. There are medical tests for each of these. Many of you have probably seen the breath test for methane and hydrogen forming bacteria. I don't order it. It's expensive. I read them all the time. People bring them in because if the symptoms are strong enough to suspect it, if they're strong enough that I would order the expensive test, I just use the patient's money to treat it rather than test for it. Right? We're going to have to treat it anyway. So it's not difficult to figure out without the test. Okay, SIBO isn't really an overgrowth. That's a misnomer, uh, but rather an imbalance in the 100 trillion bacteria in a healthy gut. 100 trillion. 20 times more bacteria than you have cells in your body. Um, 2,500 known strains. It's actually probably closer to 4,000 now, now. And there are only two that are generally used in the United States for supplements out of 2,500 right? Um, you know, that it's very slow to get approval on those. Other countries, there are more available. Uh, seven pounds of bacteria and a healthy gut. And we're one of only two species of primates that actually have good bacteria in our brains. That's pretty cool, huh? They stimulate the nerves to make new connections in the brain. So they help actually help our brain to grow. So, SIBO, MDs use rifaximin. It's an antibiotic. Um, now, you got to think, what started the leaky gut in the first place? It was a bacterial imbalance. So you're going to take rifaximin, an antibiotic, and that's often how the gut imbalance happened is someone took an antibiotic. So you're going to take it to treat leaky gut. Well, it doesn't work so well. After rifaximin treatment, if patients are tested at six weeks, 50% have SIBO again. And the further out you go, of course, more and more will have SIBO. If you use the proper probiotic treatment at six weeks, only 20% will have SIBO. That's quite a difference. Quite a difference. Okay, so you got to heal the gut. You increase secretory IgA. You reduce the inflammation. You stimulate bile flow from the liver and gallbladder, which traps pathogens. You increase gut motility to get rid of the waste faster. And by God, you got to keep the bowels open. You got to get that stuff out. Okay. So here's something called, uh, it's a diagram for something called Epicor. And as you can see here, there's a placebo and here's Epicor. And we're looking at what happens to these CD25 and CD69. These are good guy protective chemicals in the gut related to um, secretory IgA, which is very important for protecting you. You can see what happens with the placebo, and then you can see what happens with Epicor. It's brilliant. Here again, uh, tissue swelling. This was changed in paw volume. This was for a dog. And you can see the difference in placebo versus Epicor. The swelling here was at, I don't know what those units are, but 40% it looks like. And with Epicor, it was 10%. Crazy good. Okay. So large intestine pathologies, you're going to have constipation, diverticulitis, appendicitis, irritable bowel disease, ulcerative colitis, and Crohn's. And I'm not going to have really time to go into those today. I may go into them in the future, but we covered SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, CIFO, small intestinal fungal overgrowth, EPI, right, um, pancreatic insufficiency, and leaky gut. So we got through a lot today. I take a couple days to teach this class when I'm uh, teaching acupuncturists. So I, I'm going to leave it at 
small intestine pathologies. If anybody's interested in any of these other issues that I have up here, um, go ahead and uh, send me a note and we'll, I'll either talk about it or I'll post it. But it, okay, we have a question. Um, Bill says hi, and he asks, does high pH water aid in digestion? Um, no, not really. Um, high pH water has a lot of value or potentially, but anything that makes the stomach itself more alkaline can reduce uh, digestion, particularly of proteins. So I don't like how, you know, again, you see a lot of claims for a lot of stuff. And I'm just speaking really off the top of my head. I have, I am not bringing to mind any um, high quality science on this. So take what I'm saying definitely with a grain of salt. I would not use high alkaline because I want the stomach to be as acidic as possible. And hi, Phil. <laughs> any other questions? No. Okay. As my teacher used to say, no questions, many questions means there are so many questions out there. You don't even know where to start. So please join oh, us. Yes. Huh? They say thank you. Oh, cool. You're welcome. Um, so send us some questions. Anything you want to want me to talk about uh, next week? I am going to take kind of a deep dive on thyroid because so many people have thyroid uh, difficulties known and unknown. So I want to thank you all for tuning in. Be happy, be healthy. Thank you.